Uh, today's session has proved to be very popular, and uh, we have two sure-to-be interesting presentations lined up today. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I do want to let you know that today's webinar is the fifth and therefore final webinar in Polis's Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series for the 2012-2013 season. So we plan to be back in the fall when we'll kick, up, kick off our next set of webinars. And I know many of you in the room have attended most, if not all, of our webinars this season um, and in seasons past. So I just want to take a moment to especially thank you for taking the time and effort to be here uh, and for hanging out with me and all of our guest speakers over the past months and perhaps even years. Uh, I know that we also have a number of new participants on the line. So welcome to you. I certainly want to bring you into the fold. Uh, the goal of this series is to bring together water champions and professionals from all sectors and backgrounds uh, from across the country and even from around the globe, as, as indicated in this webinar. Um, and the idea is to learn about emerging, innovative, and cutting-edge ideas in water policy, law, and governance. And at today's webinar, our speakers will be discussing the idea of rights of waterways. Um, including some on-the-ground case studies, uh, as well as discussion on progress that's been made and also challenges that lie ahead. Now, of course, uh, we couldn't carry out this series without our various supporters and funders who are all listed on this slide. Um, with this being the final webinar of this season, I do want to give a special thank you um, in particular to Water Canada magazine. They've been publishing interviews with our guest speakers in advance of each webinar throughout this entire season. Uh, and I also want to thank the Earth Law Centre and the University of Auckland in New Zealand, uh, which is where today's speakers are hailing from. Uh, so there are a few housekeeping items that need to be mentioned before I can turn the mic over to our speakers. Uh, the first has to do with audio. So as you've probably noticed, I do have a blanket mute on all of the participants. Um, if you called in on the telephone and um, have pressed star six to unmute your line, if you don't mind just pressing it again, um, we'll keep everybody muted just because we, we do have a lot of people on the call today and the, the audio interference will be quite distracting. Um, the next thing is question period. So the way we'll handle this is at the end of both presentations, uh, we'll do the question and answer discussion period via the chat box. So you'll see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen the chat box there. Um, and how it'll work is I'll act as the, the moderator, I'll read out any questions that come in, and both Linda and Vernon, today's speakers, will be on the line as our panel to address any of the questions that come up. Um, the third thing is introductions. I always make a point of trying to get a sense of the community that we've brought together in the room here today. Um, so what I'd like to do is invite all of you on the line to uh, just let us know who you are, what organization you're with, uh, and also if you have multiple people listening at your end. Um, that way everybody in the room can just have a sense of, of what's happening today and, and who, who they're with. Um, and as you start to do that, I'll uh, introduce today's speakers. So Linda Sheehan is an attorney with 20 years of environmental law and policy experience, which she brings to her work as Executive Director of the Earth Law Center, uh, which is based in California. And in her role there, Linda uses legal research, outreach, education, as well as applied advocacy to develop new laws and governance models that acknowledge the natural world's inherent rights to exist thrive, and evolve. Uh, Linda is also a summer session faculty member at Vermont Law School uh, and a visiting research fellow with the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria. And that's where I got to know Linda since Polis is also housed within the Center for Global Studies. Uh, in her prior work, Linda has worked for the California Coast Keeper Alliance as well as the Pacific Region Office of Ocean Conservancy. And in 2009, Linda was recognized as a California coastal hero by Sunset Magazine and the California Coastal Commission. And our second speaker today is Vernon Tava, who I have to extend a you know, real thank you to because it is 8.07 in the morning on Tuesday where he is. Um, so we've been juggling time zones and he, he called in without complaint at about 7.30 a.m. his time today. He is a practicing barrister and solicitor of the High Court of New Zealand 
Uh, he holds a Master of Laws degree with first class honors from the University of Auckland, uh, and he received the Folds Memorial Prize for top master's students in law for his thesis. Uh, which focused on the emergence of ethno-ecological governance uh, in an analysis of the constitutions of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Vernon has worked closely with Professor Klaus Bosselman at the New Zealand Centre for Environmental the Songanui River in New Zealand, which was recently granted legal rights. So at this point, I'm going to ask Linda to bring her voice on the line, and uh, you can do your thing, Linda. Great. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, and thanks to everybody who is on the line. I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the experiences that I've had in working with folks around the world, um, including New Zealand and many other countries, as you'll see, who are all recognizing that we need to start to think about developing legal rights for nature. Um, and in this case, we're going to be talking about legal rights for waterways. I probably don't need to, to tell the folks on this call today that we're suffering from significant problems. Um, just to highlight these, I think it's important to mention them because of the urgency that a lot of them are posing to us. We're seeing that extinction rates are at a thousand times the rates across history. And when the World Bank is raising concerns about climate change, you know we have a serious problem. So there are some very significant issues that we need to address, and it seems as though the laws that we have have not been working. Um, and why is that? And that's the question that I and a number of other people who are working on this topic are asking. So our modern environmental laws came out of some very acute pollution issues um, that were really evident in around the 1960s and early 1970s. Oil spills, uh, rivers catching fire, DDT. Um, the intent of those laws, a lot of which came out of the, the first Earth Day and a major grassroots movement, uh, was to identify the goals that we need to protect the environment and then hold people who are using the environment for their own benefit accountable to those goals. Um, but the, the issue, the, the, the limitation with these environmental laws is that we assumed with them that the current overarching legal and economic structures would continue, that this idea of gross domestic product based on using the natural world for resources in our economy, that that would continue, and a number of other assumptions that would continue that were harmful to the environment. So the impact of these um, has been to sort of stem some of the most acute problems that we saw, and rivers don't catch on fire quite as often, and our beaches uh, don't have as much sewage, which is great. But on the other hand, these chronic issues, climate change, species extinctions, rivers drying up, they're continuing. And what we're seeing now is as things get tighter, um, as things get more limited with respect to water and other elements of the natural world, we're seeing a pushback. Um, and so in California, for example, uh, there was a report that came out by some of the really the best minds in the state a couple of years ago that talked about water management in California. And one of the points that the authors made was that properly designed endangered species triage might allow us to be able to have more effective water management strategies in California. And, and th this is a perspective that sort of arises naturally, unfortunately, out of our existing environmental laws because, again, they assume that this idea of the environment as natural resources, something to fit within the economic system and to help further it, that that is something that's going to continue. And that's really at odds with the idea of trying to recognize that we live in a, an interconnected world, that we and the environment are connected, and it's not something that's separate from us that we can feed into our economic system without a whole lot of thought. And so that gets us to really what one of the fundamental flaws, the limitations of our modern environmental laws is. Um, and and the, the people who are advancing rights of nature generally agree on this point, that this idea of the natural world serving humans is at odds with the, the, not just the ethics, but the science of how we as people are integrated with nature. Our environmental laws in the early 70s were adopted at a time, for example, where ecosystem science was really kind of an infant science. Um, systems theory was still very new. And so this understanding of how we're interconnected from a scientific perspective was um, still really nascent in society. And so we saw, um, you know, Pinchot, who was the head of the, the first head of the U.S. Forest Service talking about producing from the forest whatever it can yield, 
so that idea of nature as servant to us in our economic system is the one that prevails today. But at the time, back in the early uh, 20th century, when this conservation ethic was created, John Muir, of course, said famously that when we try to pick out anything by itself, it's hitched to everything else in the universe. And that's this idea that we understand now from a science perspective and more and more from an ethics perspective of our intimate connections with the environment. So how do we start to think about that, that science, that ethics perspective, um, and try to think, well, how can we shift our, our laws to better protect us, to better protect the environment? Um, and again, um, this little graphic went around after Citizens United, um, and it illustrates the frustration, I think, that more and more people are feeling with this idea that the economic system is to be fed with not just natural resources, but human resources as well. Economics, the way that we look at it today, and ecological economists express it this way, um, is that it's upside down. That right now, nature serves humans, humans serve the economic system. And that's really upside down. The economic system is just something that we made up. Um, it's a construct. Uh, the current neoclassical economic system is only about 200 years old, and its neoliberal components only about 50 or so years old. So it's something we made up as people. And of course, the earth, the ecosystems and species that we're connected with, that's the overarching entity that we sit within. So we need system level changes in our laws to be able to reflect the system level, uh, the systems that we live within as people within this larger earth system. So what does this path look like? Um, and you know, I get asked, like, well, gee, how are we going to possibly you know, change our longstanding water laws uh, here in California and around the country? But they're really not that longstanding. If you just think back um, um, two, three hundred years and go thousands of years before that, indigenous Californians had a completely different governance understanding of water, this idea of ownership of water was unheard of. When the Spanish came in the 1700s to California, they did bring this idea of dominating nature, but at least the idea of sharing water within the community was something that was, uh, was something they practiced. But this idea of first in time, first in right really took over just in the mid-1800s uh, with the California Gold Rush, this idea of dominating nature and other people with ownership rights and water rights. So it's not, it's, it's a choice. All of these things are choices that we make along the way. And they may be more embedded than other choices, but certainly it's something that we can change if we decide that we want to do this for the protection of our waterways and ourselves. So we can learn from history and think about, well, what do water rights for waterways even look like? And this is not a new idea. Um, Christopher Stone, back in uh, the early 1970s, wrote a very famous essay, which probably most of you have read, called Should Trees Have Standing, which then fed into a US Supreme Court case, a famous dissent in Sierra Club v. Morton. And Christopher Stone posited in this essay about what this would look like if trees had standing to represent themselves, if they were injured in court. And he set up various elements um, of the rights of nature, of the rights of trees and waterways in our laws, of what this would look like. And he talked about how rights needed to be subject to uh, redress in a court of law, and that the entity, in, the, in his case the trees, need standing, and they can be represented by a guardian, just as we have infants um, and older folks represented by guardians in, in court. Um, and that also when damages are calculated, it's not a question of damages for the human that owns the particular ecosystem that is being damaged, but really damages to the benefit of the system itself. So if there is money to be had, it needs to go back to restore the environment to be back where it was. In Ecuador, um, there's a long space of time here between uh, Christopher Stone's essay in the early 70s and some of the, the advancements in recent years. But um, I've been doing this work for about five or six years now, and I've seen a very significant increase in interest in this idea and changes in governance systems. And Ecuador really has, has taken the lead in amending its constitution by a vote of the people in 2008 where they added an Article 71 and 72 that talked about these ideas that were in Christopher Stone's essay and, and part of um, their indigenous life as well, that nature or Pachamama has a right to exist and persist and maintain itself and regenerate its own vital cycles. Um, so basically to exist and thrive and that any person can be a guardian in court representing an injured ecosystem. And then again, back to this idea of damages that Stone talked about, that nature has the right to be completely restored if it is indeed injured. <laughs> 
So the first case that implemented this constitutional provision in 2001 was successful, um, and uh, a river was being impacted by road building activities. Uh, all the debris was just pushed into the river, and the, the neighboring landowner sued and said the river's right to flow had been impaired. And the court agreed um, and granted a constitutional injunction ordering the people who had done the damage to restore the river, not to pay the landowners, but to actually restore the river. But again, this idea of um, recognizing the rights of nature in law needs to be something, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along, needs to be something that really is embedded in the entire system. So it is important to pass laws, but we also need to think about how the courts work, the political system, the economic system, and the administrative agency system. It's because what happens is when, when things get tight, like with water in California, there's going to be pressure. And unless people are starting at a certain point, um, to be able to understand and appreciate this idea that we need to live in a, in a, a way that's in harmony and recognition with respect for the natural world, then you are going to see pushback on the laws. That's the case with our environmental laws today, and it's been the case with the Constitution in Ecuador, where mining, a push for mining money is really um, pushing the edge of the envelope on the, the constitutional provision. And there's litigation going on right now over this um, that was unsuccessful at the lower court in implementing the constitutional provision. But certainly as things move forward, um, more and more people are going to be testing this constitutional provision and trying to make it work in light of the needs of the environment with the pressure to be able to raise funds from mining and other extractive activities. So it's an ongoing issue. Um, Ecuador definitely took the lead on this. Bolivia is another country that is moving forward. They've passed two statutes, um, the Law of the Rights of Mother Earth in December 2010, which they then introduced at Cancun at the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, and then the Law of Mother Earth and Integral Development for Living Well, which is a more detailed version of uh, the Rights of Nature provision that was passed in December 2010. So Bolivia is starting to think about this idea that is, is vexing Ecuador and, and pretty much everybody who's, who's starting to use these laws about how exactly to implement this on a day-to-day -day basis and how to change how we live our lives in light of our design to be able to recognize in our governance systems that we are connected with the environment. Bolivia was also the host of a major uh, convention. It was actually right after Copenhagen and the, the, the climate change conference in Copenhagen that resulted in a failure to address climate change and also a frustration on the part of many countries around the world who felt excluded from the final negotiations. And so these countries held a conference in Cochabamba, um, over 140 nations and 35,000 people, and they adopted a universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth um, that called for the defense of nature's rights and included a right to life and a right to exist. It was modeled very closely on the UN's Universal Declaration of the Rights of, uh, of, of Human Rights. And so this is something that people around the world are starting to embrace and move forward. So at the international level and at the national level, we're starting to see this move forward. We're going to be hearing a lot more from Vernon. With, um, I'm looking forward to that about New Zealand's work in this regard. Um, and then certainly in the United States, we're seeing uh, ordinances at the community level starting to be passed all around the country. Um, and these two community laws are integrating two things. Um, one is the rights of citizens over corporate rights. So it's getting at that economic argument that really needs to be addressed because without really taking on the economic, um, the economic push that's pushing us to think of the environment as something that is just fodder for the economic system rather than something that um, deserves to be healthy on its own, that's always going to trip us up until we address it. So these ordinances address that piece. They also address the rights of ecosystems to exist and thrive and evolve. And there's a link here to a map of, of many of these ordinances. And many, in most cases, these ordinances, um, and for the Canadian listeners, um, ordinances are equivalent, of course, to bylaws at the municipal level in Canada. 
So these ordinances or bylaws are being driven primarily by extractive activities. So a community will have a corporation, say Nestle, coming in and saying, you know, we're going to pump groundwater and bottle it and it will bring some jobs um, and is that, isn't that a positive thing? And the community says no. But because of um, corporate power in the United States, we're seeing more and more corporations say, well, we have a right to do this. And that's where these ordinances are coming from for the most part. So, for example, the largest city to pass one of these ordinances was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, about 300,000 people. And they passed an anti-gas drilling ordinance in, uh, at the end of 2010, which talked about the rights of natural communities, the uh, rights of nature, um, again, to exist and thrive and evolve, um, and including wetlands, streams, rivers, and other water bodies, and giving residents standing to enforce those rights. And that, that piece is incredibly important to be able to have enforcement capabilities. And in other areas of this particular law that aren't quoted here, the citizens of Pittsburgh um, prohibited hydrofracking, which was the extractive activity that they were concerned about, and said that corporations don't have the right to hydrofrack in Pittsburgh against the will of the citizens. So we're seeing many, many of these as laws being passed around the United States. And in Pennsylvania, there's quite a few sufficient so that they're starting to build a body of local laws to support a potential state constitutional amendment. Um, in Vermont, the state of Vermont, there is another grassroots effort, slightly different effort, to amend its constitution to address the rights of nature. Um, and in March 2013, uh, is, it's the annual Vermont Town Meeting Day where towns across the state sit and meet together to set their agendas and, and pass uh, various uh, town legislation for the coming year. And two resolutions as part of this grassroots effort were passed in support of amending the state constitution and sent up to the legislature who has already started this, pro this process. And again, as this moves forward, additional cities and towns throughout Vermont are likely to support this effort as well. And I expect in a progressive state like Vermont in a few years we'll see that constitutional amendment. Um, a slightly different model than the other um, ordinances that we're seeing around the states is in Santa Monica, and they adopted an ordinance in April of this year that, again, talked about um, the rights of natural communities, of the environment in Santa Monica um, to exist and to flourish, and providing citizen enforcement for violations of those rights. And it also, in addition, set a positive vision because Santa Monica wasn't a city that was being particularly threatened by an extractive activity like hydro fracking or groundwater extraction, um, but they do have a sustainable city plan that the residents support very much and are hoping that this ordinance in particular provides additional support for them moving forward with their sustainable city plan in light of potential corporate pushback. So in addition to talking about the rights of nature, it also talks about the rights of Santa Monica residents to things like clean water from sustainable sources and clean air and a sustainable food system and sustainable energy future. And they specifically articulated that corporate entities don't have special privilege, privileges or powers that prevent the community from exercising these rights. So it sets a different type of model where the community wanted to set a vision of where they wanted to go and use these types of ordinances and rights of nature to support it. So again, we're talking about the international level, the national level, um, the local, the city level. And um, just as an example, in California, um, is the, the process is just in the very beginning stages to start to think about water rights for rivers. So in California, legal water rights are only given to people for diversions for human uses. And no water water rights are held by waterways for their own needs. And so if there's a conflict, there's no seat at the table for the river. Um, it's basically a tussle by the water rights holders who are all human. So the idea would be in this particular example to change state law to assign water rights to rivers and to other waterways and to use science to set the necessary, necessary flows to be able to support those rights and then to be able to gather those flows through other tools that exist in the law right now now, such as um, holding hearings to see if water is being used wastefully and to be able to capture that water at some point to be able to allocate it to the rivers. And there are numerous other strategies that can be used to ensure that rivers have the necessary water that they need to be healthy and to thrive, which of course is going to be able to support us as well. And again, to be able to have uh, independent guardians that represent the rivers as their clients, um, funded with a secure funding source. So that's another model that is starting to be used as well. 
So finally, for um, the many Canadian listeners, um, there are some options, and these are um, just for British Columbia, but uh, there are certainly similar types of options in other provinces as well. Um, in a general, at a federal level, um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, in Canada talks about a right to life, liberty, and security of the person. And there has been a, a challenge file that's it's been in court for a bit and is still ongoing under this particular section um, in what's called Ontario's Chemical Valley, talking about um, people's rights to um, healthy environment. Um, and that's, the hearings are going to be coming up early in 2014, but that's one way to start to think about um, trying to recognize a healthy environment and, and what people's rights to a healthy environment are. Um, but environment's rights to a healthy environment can also be pursued at the local level just as they are in the United States. So the Constitution Act in Canada uh, says that provinces make laws with regard to municipalities. So there's a little bit more of uh, boundaries on what municipalities can do than perhaps in the states. But there is room to be able to pass these types of bylaws or ordinances as we have in the states. So in the British Columbia, its provincial act, the community charter, says that municipalities can pass bylaws with respect to nuisance and also um, under spheres of concurrent jurisdiction regulations with respect to particular areas of the environment and public health. So we'll talk about what that is. A regulation was passed um, to implement this uh, BC community charter, the provincial law, and this regulation says that municipalities can pass bylaws with respect to regulation or prohibition of activities that impact waterways. And they can pass these bylaws without provincial approval. That's the purpose of the regulation, to outline that municipal authority. And it's quite broad, um, as language goes, with respect to municipal authority. So there are opportunities to be able to apply this in a rights of waterway perspective in British Columbia. So, for example, municipal bylaws could assert the rights of waterways to be healthy, they could prohibit polluting activities, and is in Santa Monica, they could assert positive types of strategies like green infrastructure, stormwater control, for example. Um, and that um, there may potentially be uh, an idea of, depending on what the particular activity is that's at issue, there could be a, an area of preemption, such as with respect to shipping or mining. Um, but there are definitely ways to look at that and try to craft bylaws that don't conflict with those authorities. In addition to the regulation that was passed uh, to allow municipalities to recognize and bylaws rights of waterways, there is another regulation that allows municipalities to pass, pass bylaws for the protection, promotion, or preservation of the health of individuals and the maintenance of sanitary conditions, basically public health. And so there are opportunities, again, to think about how we might tie that with the other regulation on waterways to protect waterway and public health rights. And again, um, the BC Community Charter allows for some room on this, even on mining, if there's, if there's not a direct conflict. And there's a graphic here about a, a, mine in, uh, a mine in British Columbia, and you can see at the very top of it, um, there's a city butting right up against the open pit copper mine. So there's a real concern about both waterway and public health. You can see the waterways around here that could easily be impacted by this. And so there are potentially opportunities to recognize rights of waterways and take action in bylaw in Canada as well. And so finally, the last example is uh, the Raven Coal Mine, which is in the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island, about two, three hours north of Victoria. Um, and local, local people there have been fighting for quite a while this, this particular coal mine, which significantly threatens the estuary, which is the third lar largest estuary, um, I believe, on the, on the, in British Columbia. And new coal mines now are being proposed, a suite of coal mines, um, and residents there are concerned that the environmental review processes that are involved with these, which you know, of course involve many tens of thousands of pages um, of reviewing documents, these processes really box in the advocates. They, environmental processes really regulate the environmentalist. Um, and because they're not rights-based, they're not recognizing the larger systems that we need to change. And so we need to start to think, you know, is this the right approach for us? Are these environmental laws really helping us? Or are they hindering our efforts at moving forward? especially with increasing pressure on the environment as we push forward with more people and more extractive activities. And then finally in Vancouver, um, people in Vancouver have started to look to Santa Monica because Vancouver has a greenest city plan 
um, which uh, provides very specific actions that the city wants to take in order to improve its sustainability and, and, and environmental footprint. Um, and the Vancouver Charter similarly allows for bylaws for waterway and public health protection. And they're talking with Santa Monica officials right now to think about how we could start to do this in Vancouver, which is it's a very positive model up there. So, you know, the, the idea of rights of nature, of rights of waterways, is something that is, is new. It's evolving. As you can see, there are many communities from small to international that are starting to look at this. And the idea is that to be able to open our minds to other ways of governance that actually are consistent with the fact of our interaction, our integration with the environment, the fact that what we do to the environment, we do to ourselves. And these ideas can have very significant impacts on, uh, on environmental sustainability and environmental health and our own health as well. Because ultimately, you know, as we lawyers say, there's, there's the rule of law, which basically means no one is above the law. Governments have to be responsive and accountable and transparent and people need to be treated fairly. But there's also nature's rule of law, which overarches. And we need to respect the overarching laws of nature, including the laws of waterways. As we're seeing with climate change, you know, ultimately, we may be facing, as, as the World Bank said, we may be facing an, an, an unknown in our history in terms of our interactions with the Earth, an ecosystem tipping point. And we need to be able to respect that and adjust our behavior accordingly through our laws. And rights of nature is one way to do that. Um, I appreciate your attention, and I look forward to Vernon's presentation right now and your questions afterwards. So thank you so much. I'll pass it on to Vernon. Thank you, Linda. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa from uh, New Zealand, um, Aotearoa. Um, so let's wait for this slide to light up here. Okay, so I'd like to uh, talk to you today, um, picking up on a lot of the themes uh, that Linda has actually raised. Um, particularly around the idea of um, interconnectedness um, and looking at alternative forms of governance that move away from the sort of Cartesian dualism uh, that our system of uh, philosophy and particularly law is, uh, has embedded within it. But to understand the context of um, what I'll be talking about today, and particularly the um, treaty settlement around the, <coughs> pardon me, the, the Whanganui River, it's important to first of all just give a bit of background context about the Treaty of Waitangi, or in its Māori translation, Te Tiriti o Waitangi. So this is the founding constitutional document um, in New Zealand, Aotearoa. And um, New Zealand is um, quite unusual um, in that it is one of only three countries in the world uh, that doesn't have a single document written constitution. Um, so the only other countries are the United Kingdom and Israel. So there is no single document written constitution. Um, the constitution is spread across a number of documents, uh, letters patent uh, from the Queen to the Governor General, um, a handful of um, legislative acts, and um, and fundamentally, though, the Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed in 1840 between the British Crown and Māori rangatira. Uh, rangatira basically means uh, chiefs um, of the iwi, which are the larger groups. There are about nine iwi in New Zealand who have um, large territories that, that cover the country. And, um, but the rangatira, or chiefs, are actually chiefs of hapu, which are subdivisions of the iwi. Um, so it was a very controversial thing at the time um, and has remained so. Um, of course, not all chiefs were interested in ceding any form of sovereignty uh, to the British colonists. And at the time that the treaty was signed, um, the British were in fact very substantially outnumbered by uh, the Māori. And the Māori, um, quite d different from a lot of the colonial experiences, the Māori had been trading with whalers and sealers and, uh, and adventurers for quite some decades before the first British colonists arrived um, and had been um, at war um, between the iwi and the hapu themselves um, for quite some time before the British came as well. So they were unusually well prepared for the encroachment of colonialism um, and it was by no means um, an easy feat um, colonising of uh, New Zealand Aotearoa. So, there were a number of chiefs who actually um, held out and, um, and didn't sign. And of course, their, um, their ancestors um, and their, their hapu and iwi, um, there are some who have uh, maintained that they never, in fact, 
um, came under the treaty and hence never truly became part of New Zealand. Um, more interestingly, from a legal perspective, there have been significant controversies over the understanding of the concepts, and I'll get into those in just a moment, and some very serious translation issues. Um, you may be um, surprised to hear, or perhaps not, that the treaty was, of course, originally written in English um, and was uh, translated um, basically overnight. Um, a, a gentleman named uh, William Busby, the British resident, um, along with Governor Hobson, basically pulled an all-nighter and translated the treaty from English into Māori, and he had a relatively imperfect knowledge of Māori as well. So um, as a founding constitutional document, uh, there are some pretty serious deficiencies around the translation of some of the core concepts. Um, so in short, um, and I've just italicised the, the key points to pull out, and sorry for this rather wordy slide, um, there are three articles to the treaty. In Article 1, essentially, um, the agreement is that the rangatira would cede to Her Majesty the Queen of England absolutely and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty. Now that word was um, translated to the Māori as kawanatanga, um, meaning basically the power of kings, and the understanding um, of, the, of the chieftains was that uh, that was a, um, a power of, um, of government and essentially the ability for um, the British to rule over British citizens, but that the rights of, of Māori would be substantially untouched. Um, they also uh, guaranteed um, to the rangatira, the Māori of New Zealand, the full, exclusive and undisturbed possession of the lands and estates, they weren't big on using commas in those days, forests, fisheries and other properties, of course including uh, waterways. But they also granted the exclusive right of preemption. So uh, you could imagine having just looked at Article 1 and then hearing um, in Article 2, um, a definite tension had been set up between what sovereignty actually meant, and the Māori certainly understood that they would uh, maintain full, exclusive and understood possession of all nature um, within uh, the, the confines of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and in exchange for all this, the um, British would extend all the rights and privileges of British subjects uh, to the Māori. So you can see some pretty fundamental conflicts were already set up from the very beginning in New Zealand's constitutional structure. And um, for many years, um, not long after, in fact it was only about 20 years after the signing of the treaty, it was declared in an infamous uh, decision called the Bishop of Wellington and We Parata by the Chief Justice um, Prendergast of the country at the time to be a simple nullity. So essentially the treaty was effectively ignored um, for... Uh, a long time um, and actually only really began to come back into um, the, the national legal consciousness in the um, late 60s um, and particularly in the mid-70s in what was uh, known popularly as the Māori Renaissance when echoing a lot of parallel uh, movements overseas where um, it was the first time that a significant number of indigenous Māori uh, went to university um, and, um, and we had a significant number of university educated and quite radical Māori who drew inspiration from parallel movements um, and parallel movements of empowerment overseas um, and began to make some real impact in um, the circles of law and governance in New Zealand. And um, so the first major step there was what's called the Treaty of Waitangi Act of 1975 and I'll unpack the significance of that um, in a moment. Um, but most importantly, um, the treaty itself um, being a, um, <clears throat> as, you, as you will have seen, um, composed just of those three articles, was a pretty thin statement um, and certainly lacked a lot of the detail that was required um, and certainly given the, the evolution of convention um, had certainly been largely ignored. So um, something a little broader was needed to begin to bring the operation of the treaty back into law. And where that happened was quite unusually in a State-Owned Enterprises Act, which was essentially um, of 1986, which was essentially an act um, that was in fact a, a part of a neoliberal move to, um, to partially privatise um, what had been entirely state-owned enterprises. And it was referred to at the time by um, the architect of these, the legal architect of these reforms, as Sir Geoffrey Palmer, <coughs> uh, as harmless window dressing. Um, in fairness to Sir Geoffrey, he's, a, he's an eminent um, legal and environmental and constitutional scholar, um, but he is on record as saying that um, essentially uh, when members of his cabinet raised concerns that the treaty was being brought into law, 
um, in such a fulsome fashion, he said, well, we're not actually bringing the treaty in, it's the principles of the treaty, and essentially this was political payback for um, a large Māori constituency who had always supported his Labour Party. Um, so his assurances to the Cabinet at the time were that uh, this, don't worry, this won't have that much of an impact. But what they could not have predicted was a particularly activist court of appeal. Um, in New Zealand, the courts have tended to be, in the um, British model, have tended to be very, very conservative and, and to um, generally take the narrowest possible reading. Um, but there was a particularly activist court of appeal headed by um, a Robin Cook, who later became a law lord um, and was, was named uh, Lord Cook of Thorndon, the first New Zealand judge to actually ascend to the House of Lords. Um, and then there was a um, line of cases, the New Zealand Māori Council and Attorney General cases, um, in which, and there were about um, five of these cases in which the New Zealand Māori Council, um, a coalition of um, hapu and iwi heads, um, actually um, bought suit for um, a number of um, what are called taonga, and it was the, the, the taonga, uh, roughly translated as, as treasures of the Māori people, um, were sued for to actually be realised in, in a meaningful sense um, within the law. So, um, for instance, and this was, this was taken to be um, a very extensive uh, interpretation by the Court of Appeal, so, for instance, the, um, the taonga of te reo, or language, was actually used to be, um, with the Māori being an entirely, um, having an entirely oral tradition, actually having no written form, um, a well-developed um, graphical and artistic form, but no written form of the language. Um, the spoken form was, was given particular significance and was actually used to guarantee broadcasting rights, radio frequencies, a television station, and so on. And of course, the uh, recognition of um, rights to fisheries, um, large fishery quotas, uh, to forestry, um, but the one thing that was left largely untouched is water, because of course water um, is taken to be within the common law incapable of ownership. But the core concept, and this is where I'd um, like to pick up a bit on um, a lot of the uh, things that Linda was talking about, is the, the distinct difference um, of the indigenous peoples of New Zealand, and generally indigenous peoples around the world, of taking a far more holistic approach to nature and um, escaping from this, um, this sort of dualism, the, the Cartesian dualism, um, that is uh, you know, a, a fundamental operative factor in, um, in the common law, certainly, and in a lot of Western or Northern, depending on your global context, uh, philosophy. So the core concept in, in the Māori indigenous uh, cosmology is the idea of papatuanuku, uh, now, the Māori creation myth is actually between um, that in the beginning there was Ranganui, a sky father, and Papatuanuku, the earth mother, and that the two were, were pushed apart by their children who became you know, the winds, the seas, the god of war, etc. So right at the beginning in, in the creation myth there is the concept of Papatuanuku. And, um, Interestingly, um, all around the Pacific, there is a similar concept that can even sound uh, quite similar. I understand that in Hawaii, there is um, among the indigenous people, there is the idea of Papahananuku, so not a million miles away from Papatuanuku. And in fact, um, the Māori trace their origin, the first canoes, came from a mythical land known as Hawaiiki. Um, now, this is um, closely analogous to the uh, Andean concept of, of Pachamama, which is um, mentioned um, particularly in the Bolivian, but also in the Ecuadorian constitution, and that is the, um, the Earth Mother deity, or the view more of um, a holistic and interconnected nature um, that, is, um, that is constituted in an Earth Mother um, that is believed in by the Aymara and Quechua people of the uh, Andean mountain ranges, and particularly in Bolivia and Ecuador, and that those have actually been imported into the constitutions of those countries. So it's the rights of Pachamama that are actually being defended and recognized in those constitutions. And similarly, in Māori cosmology and thought, it is Papatuanuku rather than an abstract concept of uh, nature. So the Waitangi Tribunal was created by the Treaty of Waitangi Act, um, in short, it's a permanent commission of inquiry charged with making recommendations on claims brought by Māori. So the idea is that Māori do not necessarily have to sue through the courts. Um, those court of appeal cases 
uh, were unusual in being very lengthy and expensive and only accessible to um, one particularly well-funded entity of iwi. But the Waitangi Tribunal, since 1975, and this is still in operation, um, allows for claims to be made by hapu and iwi for um, particularly land, but also um, rights to fisheries, uh, forestries, and so on. And it's through this process of um, treaty settlement that um, there was actually recognition of the um, legal personhood of the Whanganui River. Uh, but just, to, um, just to, to touch on something a little more topical before we get on to the Whanganui River, the extension of these rights has been by no means uncontroversial. There was um, a lot of controversy around the foreshore and seabed, which some of you may have heard of. Unfortunately, it's been blocked out by this, uh, this uh, white box behind the text. But the picture behind this is of uh, people walking over the um, Harbour Bridge, which is, of course, um, and it's just absolutely covered in people. And that's, of course, normally uh, closed to foot traffic. That's the, the bridge that runs across Auckland Harbour, which is New Zealand's largest city. Um, that was um, taken over in a hikoi of 15,000 people, a hikoi being uh, essentially meaning a, a long march or walk, um, of 15,000 people who walked about um, 500, actually it was uh, more like 800 kilometres from um, Northland um, down to uh, Wellington, the capital, so basically the length of the North Island of New Zealand um, over 13 days. Um, to protest against a foreshore and seabed act, which was a response to um, a case of um, the Attorney General and Ngāti Appa in 2003, which recognised Māori native title uh, to the foreshore and seabed. Now, all that act actually uh, allowed was for claims to be made, um, and, and that's all it said. They would still have to be tested in the court, and the test would be stringent and rigorous, and Māori would need to be able to uh, demonstrate a continuous and uninterrupted possession of the particular area of the foreshore and seabed out to the territorial limit, um, as recognised under the treaty and, and, and um, prior earlier case law before the, um, the infamous uh, We Parata decision, which considered the treaty to be a nullity. Um, but there would be a very stringent test, and only very, very limited areas of the New Zealand coastline would actually be even open for this test to be applied, and that's leaving aside their likelihood of success. So a very narrow um, path was opened. Um, unfortunately, this was exploited by more populist politicians, and, um, and uh, people were whipped up into a frenzy of believing that all beaches and all seabed around New Zealand uh, will be uh, claimed by Māori, and that nobody who's not Māori would be allowed to go to the beach anymore, and all sorts of other wildly inaccurate assertions were made, which unfortunately um, were not properly questioned or challenged in the media, um, and that was a, um, that was a popular belief. Uh, so the government uh, reacted with a uh, Foreshore and Seabed Act, um, which removed that possibility of native title. Now, that was hugely controversial and led to the formation of a Māori party in New Zealand, which actually broke away from the governing Labour Party of the time. Uh, this was later replaced um, by a Marine and Coastal Area Act in 2011 by a um, successive government that actually created a new sort of uh, legal beast of a common area, but didn't resolve a lot of those problems. But I just raised that to, um, to um, point out to you that this, this is by no means a, an idyllic paradise where all of these ideas are well settled, that these are, of course, very controversial issues uh, anywhere that they are actually raised. So now to the Whanganui River. Now this is a very exciting possibility that actually uh, begins to recognise, first of all, the ideas that have been highlighted and raised in the Bolivian um, and particularly the Ecuadorian um, constitution, that idea of a rights of nature. Because of course in the Bolivian constitution they didn't go quite as far as to um, guarantee or recognise a legal personhood for non-human nature. What was actually recognised in the Bolivian constitution was the more common right to a healthy environment. Um, the thing that's really fascinating about the Bolivian constitution though is the extent to which that right to the healthy environment is tied to the indigenous concept of uh, Pachamama, that sort of holistic and, and particularly commons-based approach um, to governance. Now, looking at the map, you'll see uh, there's in the, in the uh, picture on the left, there's the entire course of the river, which runs from its peak in um, Tongariro, um, a glacially fed uh, river that actually runs 
um, quite a lengthy course. Um, you'll see just at the bottom right of that little of that picture there, there's a little inset of New Zealand, and the area of the map is covered. Um, and also um, next to that, there is um, a picture of. Oh, pardon me, we'll jump ahead a bit. There is a picture of all of New Zealand, um, which gives you a context of um, the size of that area. So it's actually a pretty long river that covers a um, a large area. Sorry, I'll just get the uh, technology to cooperate here. Great. Okay, so what was made was a, um, a claim. All of the claims are given the initial title Y, and this was for Waitangi, and this was the Y167 claim, which was filed by the Whanganui River Māori Trust Board back in 1990. So these claims, as you can see, take a long time to um, reach resolution. Um, four years later, the um, parts of the claim relating to the river were heard. Um, and the uh, tribunal issued um, a report five years after that, and negotiations took place between 2002-2004, but no agreement was reached at that time. More recently, however, um, very significant moves were moved towards a, um, a settlement, and the findings of the tribunal were the following, that the river is a single and indivisible entity to iwi. Because in, um, in the uh, tikanga Māori, which is the, the Māori way, or Māori law, which um, has significant and increasing recognition um, in New Zealand law, uh, the, it is not possible to um, recognise uh, single title to land or, or freehold titles. And um, it is not recognised in, in tikanga Māori that any one person or entity can have title to the land. So all land, traditionally, was held uh, of the commons, um, which, as Linda pointed out, um, has for um, most of our history, even, even the European history, and, and in England, and in the common law, um, the system on which um, certainly the, the New Zealand and, um, and Canadian and other Commonwealth countries, um, common law traditions, are directly based in, for the vast bulk of the, of the history of these countries, it was the commons um, that was a well-recognised um, system of land holding. Um, so there was no individual title that the land was held um, of the commons, which is the most ancient form of governance. And, and when we take a historical uh, perspective and look at just how recent the enclosure movements were in the um, beginning in Elizabethan England and um, really being, um, you know, to the most uh, significant extent in the Industrial Revolution, so the 1800s um, in Europe, uh, the commons are, in fact, um, and that idea of, of common and indivisible ownership is, in fact, um, you know, the dominant mode of, of land holding for uh, the bulk of our history. Um, so they also recognised that iwi possessed and held rangatira tanga, which is um, chiefly authority, um, you know, and, and a significant authority um, over the river, and that they never sold those interests, that those interests were never alienated. Um, the findings also recognised that um, although they were never voluntarily um, handed over, that there had been an expropriation of the um, riverbed because, of course, remembering that water still can't be owned. So what, what we're talking about is the riverbed, which, which they can be titled to, was affected by an act of 1903 um, and um, that there was no, no consultation nor compensation um, for that. <clears throat> so what happened was that the governance of these, um, of these waterways then passed to local and regional councils under the Resource Management Act, um, which is the um, primary environmental law in New Zealand. So um, the acts of the Crown in removing the possession and control of the iwi were, um, were an omission and a fault on the part of the Crown, and that Whanganui iwi um, have continued to um, suffer the consequences of that. So just last year, a, a quite revolutionary, and there's no precedent for this um, in New Zealand, a quite revolutionary um, settlement was reached um, in August of uh, last year, of 2012. Um, and what it recognised was um, these core iwi vision principles. Te awa tupua i te kahui maunga ki tangaroa. That is the idea of an integrated and indivisible view of te awa tupua. So te awa means river. Um, so tupua refers to the, uh, the traditional name for the Whanganui River of those people. Um, and it recognises in biophysical and metaphysical terms uh, the integrated and indivisible whole of the river. So very different from a resource management approach 
or a, even a co-governance model which, rec which recognises the, um, the correlative rights of the indigenous peoples and the government. It actually sees them as an indivisible um, whole um, that runs from the mountains, um, the, uh, Ki Maunga, to, um, through Te Awa, the river, um, to the sea, uh, Tangaroa, the Māori name for the god of the sea. The second core principle is ko o te awa, ko te awa ko o. The health and well-being of the Whanganui River is intrinsically interconnected also with the health and well-being of the people. So once again that um, is redolent of that vision that the, the health um, of, the, of the land and of the waterways is indivisible from the health of the people. So you can't recognize one without recognizing the other. So core principles of this uh, framework are these concept of te mana o te awa, that is the, the well-being or, or, um, or goodness of te awa, the river, um, recognizing, promoting and protecting the health and well-being of that river, and also te mana o te iwi, that is the health and well-being of te iwi, the, the people, that tribal group, recognizing and providing for their uh, mana, which is respect and dignity of those people in respect of the river. So once again, the people and the land are interconnected and indivisible. So to the terms of the settlement, um, and this was the remarkable thing, this is without precedent in New Zealand, certainly, and, um, and elsewhere as far as I'm aware, the statutory recognition of Te Awatupua, the Whanganui River, as a legal entity with standing in its own right. Now that is a new thing, and that is the uh, recognition um, along the lines of the granting of legal personhood, um, along the lines of what was guaranteed in the Ecuadorian Constitution. Um, so what would the uh, enforcement or raising of these rights look like is the question, though. Um, and unlike the Ecuadorian um, provision, which actually allows for any person or group of people to appoint themselves as the legal representatives, um, the uh, settlement agreement um, appoints Te po tupua, that is the, a, a small group of people within the iwi as guardians of the river. And it is them, it is they who represent the interests of Te Awa Tupua. So it's not thrown open as broadly as in the Ecuadorian constitution. It is down to those people specifically to be the legal representatives or guardians of the river. And that they would enter into a collaborative um, with the government primarily and, uh, and stakeholders, quote unquote, um, primarily landholders and farmers around the catchment of the river to enter into a whole of river strategy. Whole of river strategy, essentially we're waiting to see a little more definition um, being given to that term, but it essentially that recognizes that um, a different approach will be taken from the Resource Management Act, which actually, um, and remarkably in New Zealand, although this is common around the world, treats the governance of land and water completely differently. They're actually subject to um, different statutory regimes as if the two actually have no connection to each other. So water is dealt with under one legal set of principles and land is dealt with under another set of principles and there's very little meaningful integration between the governance of the two um, in the law. So, um, you know, end of pipe sort of realities, that is what runs out into waterways, um, is not given um, anything like the consideration that it needs to be when consents for land use are being granted. And in a country that relies so heavily on primary production and particularly dairying, that can lead um, to some quite startling outcomes and um, some very polluted waterways in certain parts of the country. Uh, so the uh, remainder of the statutory recognition of the Whanganui River as Te Awa, that is the river Tupua, um, is that the uh, settlement provides for the statutory recognition of the river as such. Um, and there's the statement in italics there that Te Awa Tupua comprises the Whanganui River as an indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating its entire catchment area, and that is the, um, the waterways, the tributaries that run through the larger area that feeds into it. one moment, sorry, but uh, there's an important caveat to all this, um, which is that in recognizing the creation of legal personality, so those precise terms are used in the settlement, um, it reflects that the river is a living entity in its own right and is incapable of being owned, quote unquote, in the absolute sense, um, and gives the river legal standing in its own right, but only through 
um, those guardians of the iwi who are appointed. Um, but they are also at great pains to say that the recognition of Te Awatupua as a legal entity does not in itself create any legal ownership in the Whanganui River or its waters. So that's the important caveat that's, um, that's worked in there as well. So this deal isn't yet done, however. Um, it's, it's significantly binding to have it in the settlement, but um, what we need to see next is the conclusion of a deed of settlement, which um, my understanding is, um, is well on the way and we'll be looking at near the end of this year. And once that's done, then legislation will be passed through Parliament. In New Zealand, we have a unicameral system, so there is just the one House of Parliament. Um, and that settlement legislation would need to be passed affirming those commitments. But it doesn't look like there will be any difficulty or controversy with it passing through Parliament. Um, and then the collaborative development of the whole of river strategy will begin. But all that is required, that, that it doesn't then become a mandatory legal consideration. Um, all it says so far is that quote unquote appropriate consideration. So a lot will sit around well, both of those words, what will be considered appropriate, uh, the concern is that when balanced under uh, conventional resource management decisions as handled by local and district councils, what will they consider to be appropriate consideration? And will consideration merely mean uh, that regard will be had to, a common term in New Zealand jurisprudence, meaning that as long as you can demonstrate that uh, decision makers thought about something, um, that can be sufficient. Um, so appropriate consideration, um, we need to take care around the application of that term. Um, appropriate consideration of the whole of river strategy. Will it just mean that regard needs to be had to uh, that strategy um, or will there be a more mandatory element to it? And that is the, um, that's the question that remains to be settled. So it's still a work in progress but it is a novel approach um, that does have significant promise as a domestic and international precedent. So thank you very much for listening. That's, that's the end of my uh, presentation per se, but I'm uh, really looking forward to um, speaking with some of you and answering any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Vernon, and, and also to Linda. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up the floor to discussion. So you're all familiar with the chat box in the corner there. Uh, if any of you have any questions, comments for um, either Linda or Vernon or both, um, please start typing them there um, and we'll, we'll open up the floor. So Linda, if you want to unmute your line, if you're muted, so that uh, both you and Vernon are on the line, that would be fantastic. And uh, according to my clock, we have about 25 minutes for questions for those of you who can stick around. So we will get going. I'm just going to uh, make the chat box bigger. So question from Pamela Zevitt for Linda. Uh, in BC, there have been a number of enabling regulations in the Local Government Act for some time. The big issue is that municipalities appear reluctant to employ or employ them, and there have been few early adopters. So Linda, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely the case, and there has been. When I, when I talk with folks who are advocates, and, you know, sort of pushing different environmental issues or, you know, just local citizens dealing with extractive activities that they don't want, there has definitely been a frustration um, on their part with what they see as um, uh, recalcitrance on the part of um, municipal city councils. But on the other hand, I think I've also seen, you know, the, a general – um, lack of awareness of the extent to which some of these tools might be available. So I think that with the growing, uh, you know, amount of extractive activities that we're seeing around not just Canada, certainly, but in the United States as well, we'll see more and more, you know, citizens concerned about this and pushing this at the local level. And of course, you know, uh, the politics that put, you know, one set of folks in can also be the politics that puts in a different set of folks. And so I think over time, as more people, in, like in the States and elsewhere, have started to do this, I, see, I think we'll see more and more um, adopters, early adopters and then future adopters. I only see, I've only seen this movement growing. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that people will take the appropriate measures that they feel is needed at their municipal level. Okay. Next question is from uh, Sherry Boudreau with the First Nations Fisheries Council. Uh, she's a water project manager there. Um, also for Linda, asking, do you have any winter's uh, Indian rights considerations for water and EP protections? 
You know, I, I don't actually. I'm not as familiar with that as I should be, I have to confess. So I'm sorry I'm not. I can certainly, you know, get your, your email and, and respond to you offline. Um, I'm happy to do that. But, you know, for right now, it's not something that I'm able to answer thoughtfully. Sorry. Okay, I can certainly put you two in touch after the webinar. So, Sherry, you can stay tuned for that. And uh, there's a few people typing typing questions here, so we'll just wait while they come into the chat box. Um, so I understand part of the introduction for our two speakers were cut off while I was talking. I don't know what happened with the audio there. Um, but the one thing I wanted to make sure that people uh, heard was that Vernon was on the line at 7.30 this morning to participate in this webinar. He's 19 hours ahead. It's already Tuesday where he is. So um, just a big thank it's you. It's surreal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Question from Robin Millam here. Um, for Vernon, how broad is the awareness of the Songanui River Agreement and the rights of nature provisions within the legal community and civil society in New Zealand? Uh, to what extent is the question of personhood rights uh, to personhood rights to waterways, I'm assuming, emerging in other areas in New Zealand? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have to say, awareness is not high. I gave a um, a public lecture um, about the, the the concept more broadly. It was actually about the um, <clears throat> the emerging um, uh, approaches to the the ethnoecological um, governance uh, that are taking place in um, in Bolivia and Ecuador. Because in New Zealand, we're having a constitutional review. Um, that was actually um, part of the, uh, we have a, a mixed member proportional system in New Zealand, so our governments tend to be coalition governments of a number of political parties. And actually the Māori Party, which you may recall from my presentation, um, was actually formed. Its genesis was in the, um, the protest around the Foreshore and Seabed Act. Um, you know, and it's, 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 you can't underestimate the, the uh, importance of that as a New Zealand political event. Um, that 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 Maori party that was actually formed um, in that conflict there actually insisted as part of its um, confidence and supply agreement with the dominant party, the um, Conservative National Party of the current government, that there be a constitutional review. And, and a big part of, of that would be consideration of the ongoing status of the treaty and also of, of tikanga Māori, the Māori ways and, and Māori law. Um, and then, hence by extension, considerations of, of Māori approaches to um, to governance of, of the land and Papatuanuku. So um, I was giving a talk around that. There's, there's reasonable awareness around that constitutional review. Um, and this was in a room of people who you would expect to have a pretty high awareness of this sort of thing. This was a room of primarily lawyers and law students. And a number of them were completely unaware of the settlement. It's not something that's been widely publicized by the government. Um, and hasn't really been picked up on by media either, um, which is astonishing to me because it is big news. Um, but it hasn't really been um, it hasn't really been picked up on. We do have a pretty conservative and relatively right wing media here. Uh, so essentially, no awareness isn't really very high. Um, the and the question of, of um, rights of personhood. Um, is not something that at this point, and this is why I will talk to anyone who'll listen and, and, and um, you know, do as many public talks as possible about this. There are a handful of us who are, who are talking about and raising these issues, but look, I have to be honest with you, um, and I wish it were different, but even in, um, even in Aotearoa, awareness of this is not particularly high. Okay, thank you, Vernon. The next question is from Harry Paul. Um, saying that regional progress needs to be redefined in a practical environmental slash legal language with some teeth in it. How could environmentally oriented people, such as this group, who are all influential and can pull strings, uh, can implement Pachimama concept in all municipal slash provincial government levels uh, progress? Oh, and then it just repeats. <laughs> there you go. Question. Um, well, I, I can I can start if Vernon wants to also add. Um, that'd be great. Um, I think that's a yeah, that's a sure. Great, it's a great question because we are seeing that in Ecuador, <clears throat> where you've got this constitutional provision, but not you know sort of the implementation language. And I have talked with with folks there um, who feel that the administrative agencies and the courts, 
need you know some guidance in this regard because they're not quite sure how to move forward with that. So absolutely, this needs to be built in. You know, one of the things that the Santa Monica ordinance did was to try to take their existing governance system and use this rights of nature ordinance or bylaw to be able to support that and move it forward and provide some additional legal support. So they already kind of have the mindset in place and they're just trying to push it forward and support it with the law. And, and certainly the work that is being initiated in California is trying to spell out what rights of waterways would look like in a very specific legal context with really particular um, recommendations as to um, changes in not just the law but the administrative processes and the funding that's available to make this a program that actually works on the ground and, and, and in the river. Yeah, um, look, I actually think, um, too, that it is actually the local level of government um, where these things can be more meaningfully um, integrated into law and can be, can be promulgated. At the national level, which is where it's been happening so far, um, it is quite safe to make um, broad statements, uh, knowing that the um, the actual the, the governance of waterways themselves is all done by local um, and district councils um, and uh, we are primarily a dairying country um, a lot of New Zealand's land mass is dedicated to agriculture and horticulture um, and the makeup of the um, of the the district and regional councils who are actually um, actually responsible for um, the governance of the waterways are um, generally uh, dominated by farmers and farming interests and uh, are really pretty conservative. Um, so, so the government, um, the central government, are able to make um, some, some very broad statements and proclamations fairly safe in the knowledge that perhaps they are, um, you know, that sort of window dressing uh, that was referred to earlier um, in, the, uh, in the presentation. Um, but that sounds a little more cynical, um, actually, than it, than it needs to. Um, I do think, um, however, though, that um, the, the local level of government is actually um, where this um, can be affected. And, th and that is, of course, I think, where it has always been envisioned as being applied. Um, as, as we saw with the, um, you know, it was the uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund um, that first got through those provisions. Um, you, you mentioned Pennsylvania. There was a Tamaqua Borough, um, also in Pennsylvania, I believe, which was the first place where those sorts of rights of nature ordinances were passed, and they were at the borough council level. Um, and that's where these things have the most teeth and the most practical effect, actually. So, um, and it only takes a few people uh, to begin talking about this at the local government level um, for it to actually um, take effect and have some, some real and meaningful um, effect. So um, that's where I think there is hope for this stuff and, um, and where it can and should be applied. That's the appropriate level of governance for it to happen. Okay, next question from Nitya Harris. Um, I'm assuming for Linda. Can BC Regulation 144 be used to enable better forestry practices in order to protect watersheds? Yeah, I really like this question because it was kind of bugging me as well. Um, it, it, and it, I was wondering sort of how you could use the really broad language in this BC Regulation 144, which is, of course, is the, uh, the waterway protection regulation. Um, because the links between forestry, you know, forest logging, et cetera, and water supply is so close. I mean, there are just numerous studies. I actually did, I actually pulled some studies in the last week um, of the links between forestry practices in Canada and water supply and water flows. And they're very, very significant. So I, I personally think that, yes, you could use uh, Regulation 144 to get at forestry practices through waterway protection, but you would have to draft it to, in a way so that it wouldn't be in conflict with what I believe, it, correct me, well, if you can correct me in the chat box if I'm wrong, that there are preemption, there's some preemption language, I believe, at the provincial level with respect to forestry actions. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that element. That was like the piece that I had to still research. So, but you, as again, the, the BC Community Charter in Section 10 allows you to be able to draft a bylaw that's not directly in conflict with um, any provincial law. So if there's a way to draft it to get around that, then I think that, yeah, you can, because the links in, between forestry and water are so close, I, I would certainly be, in, you know, up for taking a try at that. Next question from Fiona McMurrin, uh, saying the free trade deal that Canada has been negotiating with the EU, the CETA, is going to make it difficult, perhaps impossible, 
for municipalities to protect the local environment, including waterways. Will this also be a concern addressed by environmentalists in the U.S. Um, as your country begins to negotiate a similar treaty with the EU? Linda? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did hear about the CETA from uh, Canadians when I was, you know, sort of talking and researching and visiting, um, and it does seem to be a significant concern. I believe Council of Canadians is doing a fair bit of work on advocacy around that very issue. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully it, it gets pushed back um, in, in a way that protects uh, the ability of the citizens to be able to have that, you know, that local ability to be able to protect their environment. I'm, I'm certain that there, there are certainly groups in the states that work at the international level at that level and on free trade agreements that, you know, have no doubt would be involved in this particular effort. But again, you know, the frustration with the coal activists in, in Vancouver Island is certainly apply more broadly. There's, there's so few groups who are working on these issues, and the issues are so broad that it, it really takes everybody to be able to work together on these things. So it's only with, you know, grassroots action and support um, and talking with elected officials and representatives that we're going to be able to push this thing around. And I know some groups in Canada are doing as much as they can in that regard. So from Jack Menard, uh, I find many people are distrustful of science and in many cases talking to folks with logic and reason and science is completely missing the mark. Any suggestions or experiences in touching people, resource extractors, politicians, etc., with emotion? Um, I'll start off on this one if that's okay. Sure. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure about emotion per se, but I know that I think um, uh, many of us will probably have had the experience of a lot of um, a lot of people and decision makers, scientists, and so on, um, knowing that the path we're on is uh, not the right one, and that it is it is leading to our uh, our assured destruction. Um, the frustration many of them experience, though, um, and that all of us experience it at some point, if not in an ongoing fashion, is um, not really knowing what the alternative is. Uh, so. It's important that we're able to point to um, these sorts of models of these, these alternative approaches. Um, so perhaps not so much um, touching on emotion, but although I guess it is to the extent that, you know, first of all, um, it's important that people aren't in the defensive position of defending their discipline or their position or their, you know, complicity uh, in how things are. Um, and just just pointing to these these possibilities um, and and talking about them more and actually saying well you know actually there is a meaningful alternative that's that's developing and that's something that we should we should look to and something I really like to draw people's attention to is the fact that um, our and this is Linda touched on this I thought very succinctly um, was <clears throat> the fact that our um, Neoclassical economics, um, the enclosure movement, which alienated the commons, which used to be how um, most of our, our land, you know, most of the land in Europe and, and the UK and, and, and so on, was actually governed and kept, um, is a very recent thing. That we've only been on this particularly destructive path that we're on for the last couple of hundred years, um, and that that doesn't constitute most of human history, and it is something that we can um, that we can move away from. You know that there's that sense of um, of this being a, a historical deviation, that we've got it a bit wrong, but that we, we can move away. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, again, that is, you know, the, the reason that many of these ordinances at the local level in the states, almost all of them, except maybe Santa Monica, have, have arisen out of real community frustration, anger, um, concern with regard to extractive activities that they don't want. And so that, that level of community awareness really raises the community's awareness to the larger picture of, you know, sort of corporate domination of democracy and of the natural world. And so I think that that level uh, of emotion coming out of something that is sort of impacting you very directly um, has been very successful in trying to move people in a certain direction, whether it's most successful over the longer term in keeping those gains and implementing them on the ground remains to be seen because everything is, is still so fairly new. But, you know, there are some ways to be able to express things, especially where um, you're personally effective. And, and I've actually heard several stories where um, getting the grandchildren to weigh in with the grandparents if they're a decision maker has, has worked very effectively. <laughs> 
So we have two questions in the docket here that um, touch on the public trust. So I'm just going to go um, out of order. Hari, Paul, I, I, I want you to know we'll get to your question after. Um, so I may just read them both because it may make sense to address them together. Um, so from well, actually, you know, I can, we can, I can answer that question um, very quickly and easily. Um, Hari Pal's so question is that the short answer is yes, there are, there are a number of places where um, partly or untreated sewage um, is pumped out directly to sea outfalls. Um, infrastructure in, in large parts of the country have been quite badly neglected um, because they are the responsibility purely of um, local and district governments, um, many of uh, which have been driven by reducing rates as a popular move rather than investing in their infrastructure. So the short answer to that is, is yes. So um, yeah, we can go ahead and get onto those public trust questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so Hari, I guess if you wanted specific case studies, you could perhaps get in touch with me and, and um, Vernon maybe could point, point us in the right direction. Oh yeah, you're welcome to, yeah. So from David Gromfeld, um, <clears throat> specifically asking Linda, could you comment on the Songanui River case as having potential for replication in other countries, for example the U.S., under the doctrine of public trust? Might a whole river be considered a public trust to be protected as a whole? Or might there be other legal twists to recognize a river as having rights to its water using existing laws? Did you, do you, want, to, did you want to read both? or do Yeah, you want to... sure. And from Pamela Zevit here, um, directed to both of you, uh, much of what's being discussed here is reflective of the public trust doctrine, which is applied in the US, Europe, etc. Uh, there's been much discussion about how this could become adopted in Canada. But given present federal ideologies, it's unlikely we will see it being considered anytime soon. Um, how can we get provinces considering to adopt it as a policy at provincial levels? Um, and Pamela then says she teaches a professional ethics uh, to legislated natural resource and provides and applied science professionals um, and is looking to use this as an example of a model similar to our moral and legislated ethical responsibilities as professional. Um, but very few professionals have heard of it. Well, I, I'll I'll go first, and um, and then Vernon, you know, if, if that's okay, and then I'll um, if you have any additional points as well, I'm sure you will. But um, the, this question comes up a fair bit, um, the question of the public trust doctrine, especially in California, because you know it's compared with other states in the United States. California has a fairly progressive public trust doctrine. Um, it's you know there's been. Uh, case law in California that has expanded it quite significantly compared to a number of other states. So in terms of the public trust, you know, California is, is a good place to talk about that. But, you know, the, the hesitation that I've had, uh, the public trust doctrine is a great tool. You know, we should be using every tool that we have right now to protect our waterways, and certainly it's a very important tool. My focus has been on the rights of waterways more broadly than the public trust because of the, of the perspective that each brings. So the public trust doctrine is still, um, so comes from the perspective of stewarding at, on, as a commons. And in many cases, there is an overlap between you know, human interest in a healthy environment um, through stewardship and the, the health of the environment itself. But it's still an inherently anthropocentric approach, and it doesn't necessarily inherently allow for the, the perspective, the lens of the environment itself to its own health. And that's where the rights of nature, this, this indigenous concept of uh, that in this holistic science concept of the nature of nature having its own inherent rights to be able to exist, thrive, and evolve doesn't come through the public trust doctrine, which is more of a, an anthropocentric, you know, how do we use are the commons most effectively to protect it for ourselves and for our future use of the commons. And the way that it's applied, at least in California and, and many other places, also includes a balancing approach. So it allows for some damage to the commons if it's necessary, um, you know, because you only have to take action as far as feasible to avoid or minimize harm to the common interest. So it does have this sort of balancing impact, but when you think about it, if we don't care, if we don't recognize the rights of the environment to thrive, then we're impacting our own ability to thrive as well. So, the, so for example, is this question about you know the, the river having its own rights to water? I think that's the approach that that I tend to focus on more 
because it's, it's relatively underutilized right now. There are some states that have in-stream flow rights laws, um, but there's still gaps in the coverage. So what I would like to see is water rights for rivers that recognize the inherent rights of the rivers to flow with clean water, and then to be able to put that into law and to recognize that the river itself has a right to flow regardless of whether we think it's a common resource with us you know, the river itself is the river, and it may or may not, you know, through its own lens, view its, its entity as part of a commons with us. So it's more about the perspective and recognizing that we're part of a whole and getting to this holistic point that, that Vernon brought up so successfully, I think. But Vernon, I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, look, no, I mean, I think you've, you've covered that off very well. The um, public trust doctrine is not... Um, such a large feature. It, it's referred to sometimes, although it's been used in pretty limited con uh, context in New Zealand and mostly around um, uh, rights of, um, of navigation, around navigational rivers, uh, around navigable rivers, should I say. Um, but it hasn't been... Um, it's, it's more of a, a North American concept and it hasn't really been um, applied uh, that much in New Zealand, to tell you the truth. Okay, so... Um, this last question may have also been addressed. Linda, if you have any, any additional thoughts to add from Andrew Brown, um, again, about the public tr trust doctrine and its success in, in areas in the U.S., um, this concept is much less developed in Canada. Um, so do you see value in it, and would it be worthwhile to develop? So any any additional thoughts to add to that, or perhaps you've well, already come to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, you know, it is a value. It has had, significantly it's had value in California, and if you just Google um, uh, the National Audubon case in California, just Google National Audubon Mono Lake, um, the, the California Supreme Court case will come up. Um, that has some, you know, it, it, it's a good case, a good application of the public trust doctrine to get flows back into Mono Lake in California. Um, you know, the limitation is that, you know, these are sort of case by case and, you know, they can take many years to come to that kind of conclusion. And so the idea with the rights of nature approach is to try to shift the governance structure itself because the public trust doctrine alone, just like our Clean Water Act and our other water laws and environmental laws, are having a really hard time pushing back on this overarching governance structure, the economic system that we're operating under, the, you know, the privatization of water that we're starting to see. It's very hard for just these by themselves to push back, so we need to challenge the system as a whole. So I think it, it can be very important for specific water bodies, but we also need to think about changing a larger governance system. Oh, a little bit of audio interference. Somebody's line might be unmuted. You may need to press star six. Uh, Oh, that's totally fine. <laughs> um, so we are at our time. If there's any lingering questions, uh, they haven't come in in a while, so I'm guessing we, we touched on them all. But if anybody does have any other questions, you can send them to me. Um, and if Linda and Vernon are willing, um, I could pass those along to, to answer after the fact. Um, but if not, I want to say thank you to everybody on the line. I know this has been a, a long webinar, a very robust session. Um, and this is the end, as I said, of our 2012-2013 webinar series. So in the fall, you can stay tuned, and we'll have details on our next set of webinars. Um, and in the meantime, if you're interested, you can check out all of our past webinars on our YouTube channel. So I would invite you to do that. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful summer. And thank you to Vernon and Linda. If you have any last words, you can uh, go ahead right now. Uh, no, just I'd just like to say thank you very much. I've, um, I've really, really enjoyed the um, really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. And kia ora. Yeah, thank, thank you all very much. Yes, and thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.